Good morning, Worship Center. How's everybody doing this morning? Welcome to church. Let's stand. And if you're watching online, we welcome you as well. Are you guys ready to worship? Are you ready to worship? Come on, let's put our hands together. Come all you weary, come all you thirsty, come to the well that never runs dry. Drink from the water, come and thirst no more. Sinners, come find his mercy. Come to the table, he will satisfy. Taste of his goodness, find what you're looking for. Here we go. It's so God so
We're just going to keep singing straight to the heart of Jesus. Amen. Let's sing this together. Let the worship rise. Let the worship. 
worshipers arise. Come on, can we worship Jesus out loud? Let it rise. Let it be sweet sound in your ear, God. Let it be a sweet sound. continue to give God the glory by celebrating baptisms this morning. The reason we do that, the reason we celebrate together, first, it's an outward demonstration of an internal transformation that says, I've been changed by Jesus. And second, we share our testimonies because they are powerful. Scripture says our testimonies matched with the blood of Jesus. What Jesus did for us on the cross overcomes evil. It reminds us, it shows us no one is too far gone. No story is too broken for Jesus to come in and rescue us. Amen? Amen. So let's celebrate together. We're first going to baptize Josh Bear. Josh is 16 years old and is joined in the tank by his dad, Ron, who encourages him in his faith and is a good example of a godly man. Josh says he's been raised in a family that follows Jesus and at a young age decided to accept Christ as a savior. Like most young kids, he thought being a Christian meant going to church and reading his Bible. But just a few weeks ago, he felt this conviction and heard a voice saying he needed Jesus. It was then that he wanted to truly start living his life for Jesus. He has gone from hurting those around him with his words to showing kindness and knowing peace. And here he is two weeks later to profess his faith to the world. And last, we have Abby Mertz. Abby is joined in the tank by her mom, Danielle. Abby says when her grandma passed away, she was broken. She felt like there was a hole inside that was never going to be filled again. That's when she opened her Bible and realized Jesus was the only one that could fill that void. With Christ, she is whole. She will never feel alone again because she knows he will always be with her wherever she goes. Abby says that being baptized means she is finally ready to give her life to Jesus. Let's keep celebrating 
sing together in worship. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. When we exalt Him, we're elevating Him. We're, we're not denying that life is hard, that there's hard, we're elevating Him above it. There's something really special about lifting our hands because it's not just a one-way situation. When we let go, we receive what He's got. Take a minute, close your eyes, lift your hands, whatever you gotta do. And just get honest with the Lord. This is a moment, don't miss it. His presence is here. Healing is happening right now. Lies are being defeated right now. People, you are being restored right now. Receive whatever God has for you in this moment. He's good. He's good. He's for you. He loves you. 
And I'm gonna say it again, he loves you. Receive it, he loves you. He loves you, Lord, we love you. We love you, thank you, God. You're so faithful, you're so kind. We love you, amen. I want to take a minute to um, pray for some of our church family members who've experienced a loss. Um, I'm going to invite Troy, Brian, Janelle, and their families, and Elda. Elda's husband and, and their dad, Ivor Jones, went home to be with the Lord. And in talking with them before the service, what a special, special man. 62 years married. Elda and Ivor did missions together, and Elda said, 62 good years. That's pretty awesome. The legacy he's left, look at this. It's beautiful. And we know that when we lose someone, it leaves a huge void in our life. So let's go to the one who can fill that, okay? Would you pray with me? Jesus. It's, it's in the middle between the pain and the promise where we really cling to you. And God, it's where you show up in such a special way. And so I pray for Elda. I pray for, for her children and their families. God, there's so much to celebrate about his life, but there's so much loss and so much to process. And Jesus, I know that you are are the best processor, the best comforter, the best healer, the best friend. And so God, I pray that in these days and weeks to come, that they would feel your peace that passes all understanding, that they would meet you in a new way because that's what you do. That's where you shine in the dark. And so God, I just pray that the memories they have would be held so dear that's, that people would surround them with love and kindness and gentleness. Thank you, God, that our story when it's over here on earth isn't ever really over. We trust you with our hearts. God, I trust that they are in your careful hands. It's in your name we pray. Amen. I love being a part of a church family where we can celebrate together, we can comfort each other, we can mourn together, and we can trust God together. You can go ahead and be seated. Well, good morning to those of you here in the house. It's so good to be with you. And good morning to my friends online. I'm so glad you're tuning in. And whether you're online or you're here, um, God's got something for you today. And um, yeah, we got one person excited that God's got something for you today. Nice, she came for church. I like it. Uh, my name is Mandy and I have the privilege of serving on staff here at Worship Center. And one of my favorite parts of my job is teaching a class called Count Me In. And this is a class for people looking to get more connected here at Worship Center. And one of my favorite things to teach in that class is about core values. Is anybody else amped up about core values? Same person. She loves God and core values. Yes. Okay. Um, the reason I love core values is because it's talking about who we are, right? Who are we as Christians and who are we as a church family? What are we known for? I think that really matters. One of our core values here at Worship Center is excellence in stewardship. That's a fancy, mouthful way of saying being faithful with what's right in front of us. And we have this opportunity in our lives to show up to moments and be faithful and sow seeds. You know, in the Bible, it talks many times about sowing seeds and growing what we plant. We will always grow what we plant. And we can't always see that. We might not always see the results of the seeds we're sowing, but God's asking us to be faithful. Faithful to the season you're in, faithful to the people in front of you, faithful with what he's given you. We have this moment every week where we have this opportunity to give. And we have this opportunity to sow a seed and leave a legacy because guess what? This isn't it. There's more. 
And that's good news. This moment isn't it, but this moment is everything. And so we can show up and trust God that when we're faithfully planting seeds, he is going to grow a beautiful harvest and it's going to be a beautiful legacy for our children and their children and their children. And I wanna be a part of a church that's leaving a legacy. I wanna show up faithful. I wanna sow beautiful seeds so I grow a beautiful life, amen? So this morning, as you give, you can give through texting, you can give online, you can give by dropping it off in the boxes at the back of the auditorium, but whatever it is, when we live open-handed, there's goodness on the other side. Let's pray together. God, thank you so much that you are faithful, that you are good. Thank you, God, that you care about even the smallest thing. Thank you that you're always calling us to you to trust you more. And this is just another way. And we know, God, that every good thing we have is because of you. And we want to be people who live open-handed. God, we love you. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Thanks for your generosity. So in 2019, uh, it was a year that we really felt like God brought some really cool, unique opportunities our way. And as we just were putting them before the Lord, we just really felt him impressing on us as leaders, like grow, expand. It's time to grow, it's time to expand. And so as we walked into 2020, we were so excited and we saw 2020 as a year of growth and what God was just leading us into next steps, even beyond uh, shows on the stage. We just saw, yeah, we just saw so much coming our way that he just apparently was opening so many doors. So beyond growth for 2020, we were really excited because Esther was hitting the stage for the first time here in Strasburg. And for premier years, that's a really big year for us because normally that is a year that we usually s sell out most of our shows. Um, so we really rely on the premier years to get us through until another premier year comes through. And so coming into 2020, um, looking at all the reservations that were already already made, we were looking at a year that most every show was sold out. The Thursday before we were supposed to open, um, we knew the governor was coming out with an announcement. And so all of the leaders, um, our key leaders, we gathered upstairs um, just to hear what he had to share. So this was Thursday, the, ha the theater was full of activity, just getting everything ready for our first premiere that night. We huddled together to watch the governor and what we heard announced, uh, we knew we needed to make a decision and make a decision quick. So we just got together as a team right there and then after the governor's orders and um, just asked the Lord for discernment and felt like, yes, we're gonna, we're gonna close our doors to the public um, and not open the show as we intended to that Saturday. Yeah, little did we know that that's, that started a journey of a lot of unknowns and a lot of hard days. I don't think I've ever walked through a season that control was so not even attainable. And so I found very quickly um, just walking through this season and the unknowns and coming to the end of last year, um, it just, I know that he desired to take who, what we thought we could do out of us going, God, this is totally yours. And it literally was, I think, how the only way I could sanely get through some days just going, Lord, I give this to you. And I give all of our employees to you. I give the future of this place to you. Um, and so surrender was an anchor, um, anchor word in our whole family's life for sure. We had a lot of people in the Harrisburg area um, that we were able to just work, work with. Um, they were great to work with and we just kept reaching out like, do you see a time frame that we can open? And so once we got the go ahead, um, we got the go ahead to open up in June in Missouri and we got the go ahead to open up here in July. And normally, we get so excited when we can open our doors because we're always closed every year, January, February, that's normal. And then we open our doors March and it's always such an exciting time to open and just see people coming back in. That was not true on this occasion. Opening back up in July here in Pennsylvania was very, very hard. And through 2020, even when the church doors opened uh, back up in June, I think we came once or twice 
because we were just excited to be around people, but we found it was exhausting running into people at the church, just trying to like, and people genuinely wanted to care, but they're like, how are you guys doing? And oftentimes made me tear up because I was like, I'm so tired. And so I found um, coming to church was hard just because at that point in time, we needed just a haven at home and a quiet day. We did choose to stay home from church on Sundays, tune in on Sundays um, online. Um, and that we knew that's what we needed just to be rejuvenated to get into another, into another week um, here at the theater. So that takes us going into 2021. And Matt looked at me and he said, I really miss just being with community at church. And he said, I really just miss worship with people. Um, Cause it was a different dynamic. Like you can get fed with the word at home, but worship just felt different for us. And so he looked at me, he said, are you ready to go back? And I said, I think I'm ready. I agree with you. It's, it's, it's time to just be able to experience that worship together. And so we come into the doors um, and it felt good walking in. And so we have worship and I was like, ah, this feels awesome. The media portion came on for the series that Matt was walking into. So this little girl shows up and it's storming. And I was like, oh, this is great. So cute. And then as I continue to watch the teaser, it starts hitting home. And I see her grab her rain boots and I see her grab the umbrella. And then she goes outside and she jumps into that puddle. And I was like, I, I lost it sitting there. And I was like, Lord, that's me right now. That is me. I don't want to jump into this puddle anymore. But I saw that smile on her face and I just went, God, that is what you're calling me to do. You're calling me to continue to pick up what you've placed us, placed in our hands to do. And even though our storm is far from over, like I don't see any sunshine coming out yet. I don't see the rainbow appearing, but I was like, that's what you're calling us to do. In the middle of the storm, um, you're calling us to get back out there. And even today, as I'm sitting here speaking, like it's still raining, it's still, it's still stormy but I really felt like the Lord was like, you, you got this, I'm with you, I live in you, I've given you and equipped you with what you need. Get out there and you can jump in those puddles and even though it feels messy, I'm with you and um, equipped you for what I've called you to do. Matt and Amy, thanks so much for sharing that. Matt and Amy and Neff have been part of our church here for many, many years. And uh, I'm sure they're not the only ones that have gone through some hard times over the last year and seeing God's faithfulness show up in the middle of that. And we love to hear your story, so love to hear how God's working in your life. So if, if, if that's you, I would love to, if you would just let us know. You can email us in our, in our church office. You can email me directly at pastormattworshipcenter.org and uh, let us know how God has been meeting you in your life as well. Well, we're at part eight of our series called Made for This Moment. We're wrapping it up today, and I'm excited about where this is landing. And uh, I want to, our assignment for this message is 1 Peter chapter 5. I want to read verses 1 through 11. Are you ready to go today? All right. Uh, I invite you just to open your heart, open your ears, uh, open your eyes to see what God wants to speak to us today. Let his words uh, come alive to us. So let's read. Verse 1. Peter writes, and now a word to you who are elders in the churches. I too am an elder and a witness to the sufferings of Christ. And I too will share in his glory when he is revealed to the whole world. As a fellow elder, I appeal to you, care for the flock that God has entrusted to you. Another translation says, be shepherds of the flock that God has entrusted to you. Watch over it willingly, not grudgingly, not for what you will get out of it, but because you are eager to serve God. Don't lord it over the people assigned to your care, but let, lead them by your own good example. And when the great shepherd appears, you will receive a crown of never-ending glory and honor. In the same way, you who are younger must accept the authority of the elders, and all of you Dress yourselves or clothe yourselves in humility as you relate to one another. For 
God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So, humble yourselves under the mighty power of God, and at the right time, he will lift you up in honor. Give all your worries and cares to God. Give all your anxieties to God, for he cares about you. Stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for, looking for someone to devour. So he may sound like a lion and he may prowl around like a lion, but he's not a lion, just letting you know. And what are we supposed to do about that? Stand firm against him and be strong in your faith. Remember that your family of believers all over the world is going through the same kind of suffering you are. In his kindness, God called you to share in his eternal glory by means of Christ Jesus. So after you have suffered a little while, he will restore, support, and strengthen you. And he will place you on a firm foundation. All power to him forever. Amen. Amen. God's word. Are you thankful for God's word? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for this opportunity we have to dig into your word. And my prayer is that we would have ears to hear. And not just be hearers of the word, but be doers of the word. So would you give us the strength and the courage to apply your word to our lives. See how our faith can really intersect with our lives. And I thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. title of my message today, as we conclude this series, is simply called Grace for the Humble. Grace for the humble, it's a path. And as has been our practice in this series, we're just going, going to go through this passage kind of line by line, passage verse by verse, and see what God is speaking to us through this. And as we, re as we heard this and read it, we realized, and, and I see that Peter starts out with this analogy of sheep and shepherd. And that's an analogy Jesus used very often. Peter would have heard Jesus talk about sheep, Shepherd, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. My followers are like sheep. Uh, they know me. I know them. They know my voice. And uh, it's this great analogy that's been used uh, many times. And when you and I think of sheep, we, we probably think of white, fluffy animals, warm and fuzzy, you know, led, lead beside the still waters into green pastures and just get, makes us feel, you know, all warm inside. But as I've done a little bit of research on sheep, it was very hard for me to find any, really any kind of, uh, of information about sheep that was even re remotely kind to sheep. <laughs> now, I've read some articles written by sheep herders and uh, farmers who own sheep in modern day. And while they would say sheep are intelligent, most would describe them this way, that sheep are directionless, defenseless, and dumb. The three Ds. <laughs> Actually, I read one uh, commentary on sheep by a pastor who was formerly known as a shepherd, and this is how he described sheep. He said, a sheep is a stupid animal. It loses its direction constantly in a way that a cat or dog never does. Even when you find a lost sheep, it will not follow you home. When you find it, you must grab it, you must seize it, tie its four legs together, and carry it home. That is the only way to save a lost sheep. And Jesus said, we are all like sheep. <laughs> Maybe we should just think about that metaphor the rest of the morning. But I just have a question. If I could ask Jesus, i say, why don't you compare us to like tigers or something? You know, all, we're like tigers and we know his voice. Or we're like cheetahs or gazelles or something. Like, but he said we're like sheep. Why? Why would he use it? I think it's very important we understand why this analogy was used, because it was used intentionally. And it points to um, very important truths about our spiritual condition. We can learn a lot from sheep. Like sheep, there's three things that stick out. Like sheep, we, are, uh, we all need to be rescued, prone to wander. Again, we're talking about spiritual condition. We all need to be rescued. Like sheep, we need to be protected. Sheep are defenseless. Really, their only defense is to stay with the flock and with the shepherd. And I would suggest that the only reason sheep have survived all of these centuries, generation after generation, is only because they stayed with the flock and stayed close to the shepherd. Otherwise, there's not much chance of a sheep surviving. 
And then like sheep, we need to be led and fed. We need a shepherd. Protected, we need to be rescued, protected, led and fed. Now, I get it. I understand why this analogy can rub us the wrong way, especially here in Lancaster County. I grew up in this area. You know, Lancaster County, we have this, uh, we take pride in being resourceful and responsible and be, to be good and to do good and to contribute to society. I, I think that's a great characteristic of this county. But I also understand when we're compared to sheep, it can, it can rub us the wrong way be, because it seems like, is Jesus really saying that we're dumb or not intelligent? And again, he's not referring to our intelligence Physically, we can do a lot of good physically. He's referring to our spiritual condition. Because of sin, sin makes us dead. Sin makes us utterly helpless. There's nothing we can do to help ourselves when it comes to salvation. Nothing. Because when you're dead, you really can't do anything to help yourself. Sin doesn't just make us bad, it makes us dead. And so we need a shepherd. We need a savior who will rescue, protect, lead, and feed. And that rescue, that shepherd is Jesus. And so Peter starts this whole section off by pointing to Jesus, our Savior, our shepherd, and by reminding us that we're all sheep. Because when we know we're sheep, it is the great equalizer, isn't it? We all started from the same starting place spiritually. And so as we go through this passage, Peter addresses three areas that we can experience grace for the humble. And the three areas are first, humility. He talks about humility. He talks about anxiety. And he talks about the enemy. And then when we walk through this and deal with it according to scripture, there's a result of that. That's what we're gonna look at today. So if you're taking notes, number one, here's where we're gonna start. You gotta choose humility. You gotta choose it. Human beings are not naturally humble. We do, do, we do not just naturally get more humble as we get older. We don't wake up with more humility. We drift away from it. And Peter, from the beginning, he talks directly to um, spiritual leaders, right from the beginning of this passage. Why is that? Because if you have some level of, of influence over other people, whether it's spiritual influence or other, there's even a greater temptation to, to move away from humility. So he's saying if you have any level of spiritual influence, any type of leadership, choose humility. Care for people willingly. Care for those that have, who have been entrusted to you willingly, eager to serve God. Don't do it for what you're going to get out of it. Do it and, and by, your, by leading by your own example. Because we have a great shepherd and all of us need this great shepherd. So when it comes to spiritual leadership... Peter said it's not about position. It's not about uh, some kind of platform you're building. It's not kind of you know, gaining more power. It's about a posture of humility. Now, Peter was not the most humble guy. And really, uh, none of the disciples were because Jesus on a regular basis had to continue to teach them and show them what it was to be humble. I mean, there were many times recorded in the Gospels where the disciples were arguing about who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom of God and who's going to sit beside Jesus on the right and on the left when he comes into his kingdom. So Jesus would constantly have to pull them together and say, look, you know that the world that we live in, and we see this today, the world we live in, uh, the rulers and the authority, they are about position. They're about gaining more power. They're going to climb the ladder for more influence. And it doesn't matter who they trample on but not so with you and not so in my kingdom, this kingdom of God. He said, in my kingdom, if you want to be great, if you want to be first, if you want to have a lot of influence, you got to serve. It's the way, choose humility. Jesus taught that a lot, and I don't know if Peter fully understood that. He had these many opportunities to show that he wasn't the most humble person. And we know that earlier in this series, we know that uh, Peter would say, you know, Jesus, I'm going to follow you. I'll never leave you. I would even die for you. And Jesus said, well, die for me. You're going to deny that you even knew me three, three times. He's like, what? I'm not going to do that. Well, right before Jesus is about to be crucified, Peter denies that he even knew Jesus three times. You can imagine the regret, the shame, the disappointment he would have felt in himself, disappointing his Savior, you know, eating his words in front of everybody else that he proclaimed he was never going to leave, you know, never going to leave Jesus' side. Well, fast forward through crucifixion, 
the resurrection of Jesus, there's this moment that Jesus has with Peter where he shows how much of a, of a good shepherd he, Jesus is. So Jesus, he, after he rises from the dead, he reappears to his disciples a few different times. There was one specific instance recorded in John 21. The disciples were out fishing. They catch a whole bunch of fish. They meet Jesus on the shore, and they eat together. And I want you to see this moment that Peter has with Jesus. John 21, 15 says, After breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? More than these fish, more than fishing, more than these other disciples? He gives him this opportunity to answer the question. Yes, Lord, Peter replied, you know I love you. Then feed my lambs, Jesus told him. Jesus repeated the question, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, Peter said, you know I love you. Then take care of my sheep, be a shepherd. Care willingly, not grudgingly. Eager to serve God, not for what you're gonna get out of it. A third time he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was heard that Jesus asked the question a third time and he said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said, then feed my sheep. What was happening in this moment? This was a defining moment for Peter. Two things that Jesus did and that Jesus still does today. Restoration and transformation. First, Jesus restored Peter in the very uh, area where he fell short. Jesus publicly restored Peter, gave him the opportunity. He denied th Jesus three times. He gave him the opportunity to confess publicly and restore his devotion to Jesus and his loyalty to Jesus. Restoration took place. And I believe from that point forward, all of that guilt and shame, disappointment that, and regret that he had began this healing process. Restoration. The second thing we see is transformation. Remember, uh, Peter was a fisherman. And early in, when, when Jesus called Peter to follow him, he said, follow me and I'll teach you how to fish for people. I'll make you a fisher of men. In this moment, Peter went from being a fisher of men to being a shepherd. He was transformed. Because being a fisher of men, you're just trying to you know, reach as many people as possible and attract as many people as possible to Jesus. And Jesus said, no, from this point forward, you're going to be a shepherd of my people. You're going to care for them. You're going to walk with them. Transformation took place. And I'm here to tell you today that he, God can do the same thing in your life. He can restore you and transform you. If you ever felt like you've made too many mistakes, you've had too many regrets, you have guilt and shame about things that you've done in the past, God can restore you and transform you to use you for the purpose that he's created you to be. And so Peter said there's grace for the humble, but God opposes the proud. Why does God oppose the proud? Why do you think God opposes the proud? Because the proud oppose him. The heart of pride never admits that they do anything wrong, never admits they, their need for repentance or forgiveness or turning from, from their evil or wicked way. The heart of pride prevents any kind of reconciliation before God. The heart of pride prevents any kind of reconciliation with other people. I mean, how many relationships friendships, marriages have been broken because of pride. Pride, thinking that we need to do something to prove something or find some kind of validation in and of ourselves. And pride, I would suggest to you, is the greatest barrier or roadblock to spiritual progress because it puffs up. We find our significance and our validation in and of ourselves. We could say it's kind of like the inflammation of the soul. Think about inflammation. Inflammation in the body is the primary cause of all roads that lead to death, other than accident-related situations. Inflammation in the body. And I had to uh, talk to a medical doctor to verify this. Inflammation in the body is the, is the cause of stroke, uh, cancer, heart disease. So many health problems come from inflammation in your body. So... The way to get healthy is to reduce that inflammation. 
Think about how pride puffs us up. Well, if, if, if we have inflammation in our soul, we, the antidote or the anti-inflammatory medicine for that is choosing humility. And humility is, is when we find our validation from God, then we don't have to prove anything to ourselves or to anyone else because we find it from him. That's the pathway to experiencing God's grace in our lives. Number one is choosing humility. Second thing Peter addresses is anxiety, and he would say, release anxiety. Give your worries to God. Cast your cares on the Lord. What do you think about when you hear those phrases? Do you think about the noun part of that or the verb? You know, give your worries to God, Peter said. Worry. I read this quote that worry is like a rocking chair. It will give you something to do, but it won't get you anywhere. Isn't that true? Worry, anxiety, the cares. Now that's a reality of life, but really worry it comes, stems from this fear of the future, fear of the unknown. And that's part of living in this world. We don't know what's going to happen in the future. I read about, recently I read about something called um, psychological immune system. You know, our bodies are amazing. God, we, we've been fearfully and wonderfully made by a creator. And we know, we know we have physical immune system. Physical immune system means when it's this process that goes into place when if you get a cut or if you experience some kind of virus, your body immediately goes into this process to fight off uh, the virus or to heal the cut. So our bodies are created by God to be self-healing. Well, there's something called uh, psychological immune system, and it's a similar process, but it has to do with our mental and emotional well-being. Most people are generally not good at forecasting what's going to happen in the future, at least forecasting it accurately. And so when we fear something that's going to happen in, in the future, uh, our cognitive bias is in play, meaning that we think something bad that's going to happen, it's going to be way worse than it actually is, or it's going to impact us way more than we think it is. We do it on the positive side, too. We think good things in life are going to be way better than they actually are, and bad things are going to be way worse. It's our cognitive bias in that way. So when it comes to um, difficulties, stressful situations, we've been designed actually with this psychological immune system to actually be able to deal with those much better than we think we can. And so most times, most people are unaware of this ability that God has created us with, or we underestimate this ability to weather the storm. And so it kicks in uh, this opportunity to, to worry. And worry simply is just paying tomorrow's fears with today's peace. And there's a temptation to worry. There's a temptation to, uh, you know, experience anxiety. There's a temptation to hold on to the cares that we're carrying. And what did Peter say? No, he said, cast those cares to the Lord. He says, release that anxiety. Give those worries to God. How do we do that? And why do we do it? I think sometimes we have this idea that casting the care just means to throw it, kind of like a boomerang, but we know if you throw a boomerang right, it's going to hit you again. But we're not just trying to, you know, ignore worries or fears or anxieties. We actually can give them to the Lord because he cares for us. He, God, I want you to remember this, that God cares for you and he will carry you through. He has created you that you can handle it. Whatever comes into the future, you can handle it and he, because he cares for you and he will carry you through. So when we release anxiety and give our worries to God, we actually can receive promises back in exchange. It's amazing what God offers through his word. I want you to see them. Four things that we see that we can receive. Number one is courage. Courage to face the unknown. Courage to face our fears. Isaiah 41.10 says, don't be afraid for I am with you. Don't be discouraged for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will hold you up with my victorious right hand. God has promised us to, to live with courage. The second thing he promises is wisdom. Wisdom to understand spiritual insight. 
James 1.5 says, if you need wisdom, ask our generous God, and he will. Everybody say will. He will give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking. So God offers not only courage to face our fears, he, gives, he offers wisdom to understand how to walk through this. The third thing he offers is strength. Strength to do what we know to do, what we're supposed to do. In Philippians 4.13, simple verse, I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. Strength to do what God is calling us to do. And it leads to the fourth thing, faith. Faith to trust God that he will do what we cannot do. Psalm 37 verse five says, commit everything you do to the Lord. Trust him and he will. Everybody say will. He will help you. These are promises we can hold on to. So when Peter says, cast your care or give your worries, he's not saying that's the only thing to do and hopefully they don't come back. He's saying release that anxiety to God, let him take care of it and receive courage, wisdom, strength, and faith. What an exchange, what a trade we get to walk in. That's my prayer for us today is as we're thinking about anxiety, if, we're th- if you're dealing with some type of worry, my prayer is that you would take, take this step because I want you to know that this is how we bring God into our situation. It's how we can be disciplined to bring God into our situation. But we do it because God cares for you, he cares for me, and he will see us through. We can hold on to that. Release anxiety. And that brings me to the third thing that Peter addresses. The enemy, we gotta resist the enemy. Peter said, watch out, be alert, stand firm, be sober. You don't have to fear the enemy, but you need to be aware. Well, who's the enemy, who's the devil? The devil is the voice of the false accuser. He sounds like a lion, prowls around like a lion, but he's not. He's a pretender, he's a counterfeit. He's already been defeated. But we have to be aware. What's the best way to to spot a counterfeit? By studying the counterfeit? No, by knowing the truth. So if we go back to this analogy of sheep and shepherd, um, again, I think this is a great analogy for us to understand because Sheep, their only line of defense is to stay with the flock and to stay with the shepherd. Any kind of predator that comes to attack the flock will try to get one of the sheep away from the flock or away from the shepherd. And if that takes place, that sheep is left as an easy target. What does that teach us? Again, if we're all like sheep, what does that teach us? It teaches us that isolation makes us vulnerable. We were designed for community. We were created to be in relationship. It's how we grow best. And isolation and loneliness are very real struggles right now. What happens when somebody deals with isolation, experiences isolation, very easily it can turn into these thoughts and these lies that you don't have a place to belong, You won't be accepted. Um, You've made too many mistakes. Everybody else's life is going great except yours. And that just leads to being more isolated and leads to being more lonely. And then that can easily spiral down. That isolation can spiral down into thinking that, does anyone even see me? Does anyone even care about me? Does anyone even know that I exist? Will anyone miss me if I wouldn't be here? Does God even see me? Does God care? And that isolation can very easily turn into thoughts of suicide and wondering, is life even worth living? And let me just tell you, I, I plead with you today, if that's you, if that describes your situation, if you're struggling with those kind of thoughts, please talk to somebody. The truth is life is worth living. God does see you. He loves you. We see you. We want to walk with you. Reach out to someone for help. Bring those thoughts into light. There's no shame in experiencing that. 
If you're dealing with that level of isolation and loneliness, talk to somebody. If you know someone who's dealing with that, please have them talk to someone. We'd love to walk with you. That's what we're here for as a church. We want to be connected together and walk with people. And Peter, he, he reminds us how we handle those situations. This is what he said. Let's go to verse 9 and that we read earlier. Stand firm against the, the, the enemy. Resist him. And be strong in your faith. But then he says this. Remember, your family, that your family of believers all over the world is going through the same kind of suffering you are. So you're not alone. Whatever struggle you have, whatever trial you're facing, you're not alone. That is so important to understand. There, there are people experiencing the same thing you have experienced for generations. And this is why we need a shepherd. It's why we need a savior. Resist him. How, how do we resist? Resist simply means don't yield to, withstand, oppose. How do we resist something? Well, let's say you are on a diet and you're trying to resist eating dessert. You don't look at a brownie Sunday and say, I resist you, brownie Sunday. No, that's not how you resist a brownie Sunday. You stand firm in the eating plan that you decided you were going to follow. And you stay committed to that plan. It's the same way in our faith. We don't have to talk to the devil and say, I resist you, I resist you. I know you sound like a lion, but I resist you. No, we stand firm in our faith, standing firm in who Jesus is, our Savior, our shepherd. That's how we resist the voice of the pretender, the counterfeit, the voice of the false accuser. Peter says, when you, when you take that pathway, you're going to experience grace for the humble. And that grace for the humble, the result of that is number four. You'll be able to stand confidently. Stand firmly. Grace for the humble does not, it's not a place of weakness. It's a place of standing confidently because you find your validation in who God made you to be. So while we might not like being referred to as sheep, the truth is it's talking about our spiritual condition the good news is we have a shepherd who has rescued us and redeemed us so that we can stand confidently. 1 Peter 5.10 says, in his kindness, in his grace, God called you to share in his eternal glory by means of Christ Jesus through what Christ Jesus has done. So after you suffered a little while, not because you have to go through suffering in order to earn this, but it just simply means, hey, if trials come, no big deal. If I'm going to suffer a little bit, I can get through this. You know why? Because I know that in a little while, God will restore, God will support, and God will strengthen you, and he will place you on a firm foundation. So many people say, uh, what is God's will for my life? I just want to know God's will for my life. Well, I would encourage you to start here. God's will for your life is that he will restore, support, strengthen, and place you on a firm foundation. That's the good news of who Jesus is. That's the gospel. There's nothing we could do to help ourselves. Jesus did everything. And now when we walk with him, we experience the life that we can stand confidently in him. Stand confidently. Where's your confidence? Where is your confidence in him? Where is the, what level is it? As we bring this whole series to a close, you know, we just spent eight weeks investing, understanding the hope that we can live with. This letter of encouragement that Peter wrote is so that we can be hopeful no matter what speaks to us today in 2021. We can be hopeful. We, that, that was the starting point. That's the thread we see. And it ends with being humble because there's grace for the humble. So let me leave you with two questions. And I love questions. I would encourage you to, to uh, discuss these at your small group. If you're not in a small group, find someone, a trusted friend, you know, talk about it in your family. But when we discuss God's word, discussion leads to discovery. It's how we grow. It's how we learn from one another. And the first question is this. What helps you believe that God cares for you? Do you believe that God truly cares for you? 
And what are the things that, that help you believe that? That has to be settled in your life because if this is not settled, what happens is there will be uh, circumstances and situations in life that will make you question, tempt you to question, does God really love me? Does he really care about me? And so get that settled. What convince, Are you convinced that God cares for you, loves you? And if you're not, let me tell you, this is where you can start. God loved you so much that he gave what was most important to him, his one and only son. Gave up his one and only son so that you could have a personal relationship with God. That's how much he loves you. Think about the, the, the most important, the most valuable thing that you own. What's most valuable to you? What relationship is most valuable to you? If it was up to me, I don't think I could give up my, my only son. I don't think I could give up what was most valuable to me for someone else. That's what God did for you and for me. He gave up. That's how much he loves you. Don't ever lose sight of that. How much he cares for you. That leads me to the second question this, because these are so tied together. What worries are you carrying that it's time to release to God today? What worries, what anxieties, what cares are you carrying? And, and God is inviting you to say, look, you can give your worries to God and in exchange receive courage, wisdom, strength, and faith. Take an opportunity to list those out, list those worries that you might be carrying right now. And see those worries compared to what has convinced you that God loves you. And know that it's time to give those to God because he cares about you so much. Because God cares for you and he will carry you through. You believe that? All right, I gotta be done today. Can we thank God for his word? Oh, I'm serious. I hope that it encourages you and challenges you. We're having a lot of fun today. So let me pray for you. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for your word. And it is life. I see it, I, I see it speaking life into people. Your word is like seed and our hearts are like soil. So my prayer is God that we, our, our hearts would be like good soil and, and it would stay cultivated and stay uh, ready to, to keep that seed in there and keep it growing and developing and changing into this growth that produces a great harvest in our lives. God, I pray for those who may be dealing with isolation, loneliness right now. This, these last 12, 18 months have not helped. God, I pray today that, that the truth, how much you love and care for people. I pray, God, that you would make that so clear beyond a shadow of a doubt. Every person within the sound of my voice would know how much you love and care for them. God, for those who may be dealing with thoughts of suicide, wondering, is life worth living? Is this all there is to life? It just seems like there's so much chaos and hardship in the world. God, would you remind us today that yes, life is worth living. You have an incredible plan and purpose for our lives today and it's to, um, to leave a legacy for the people behind us, to make an impact in the people around us. It's to love the next generation coming behind us and to see as many people as possible, we can be a part of bringing as many people as possible into your kingdom, what you called us to do. And Lord, I pray you would show each of us what is our part, what's my part in that. I thank you for that. In Jesus' name, we all said, amen, amen. Would you just keep your heads bowed for a moment? I don't want to dismiss without giving you an opportunity. If you've never made a decision to follow Jesus, you've never made a decision to uh, receive this gift of salvation, today's your day. Whether you're here in the building or you're listening or watching online, today can be your day. 
All of us are like sheep. Spiritually speaking, all of us are like sheep. We need to be rescued. We all need to be protected. We all need to be led and fed. And this pathway to experience salvation starts with acknowledging that fact. There is nothing we can do to save ourselves. We can try to be good, but being good is not going to save yourself. Maybe you've been taught that good works outweigh bad works and they're gonna be measured and that's how you experience salvation. That's not true. Salvation comes by placing your faith in Jesus, repenting of our sins, receiving forgiveness and placing our faith in Jesus. That's the starting point. And so if you've never made that decision, you're ready to do that today, I wanna lead you in a prayer because it's a prayer that sets you on a path to know that God is for you, he's a shepherd, he leads and feeds, he guides, you're not alone. That's the starting point. And it's a starting point of surrender. So if you're ready to make that decision, I wanna lead you in a prayer. I'm just gonna invite you to repeat this prayer after me. We can all say it, just say, Heavenly Father, I thank you for Jesus. I believe he is the Son of God. I believe he died on the cross for me. I believe he rose from the dead for me. Today I repent of my sins, receive forgiveness for my sins, and choose Jesus to be my Lord and Savior. My old life is gone, and a new life has begun today. <laughs> In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You can all look up. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, or if you know you just this was the moment to get your life right with God. I want to invite you to do something that takes courage, but it's very important. Would you just put your hands straight up in the air, unashamed of this decision? We had a couple people respond uh, last night and in the first service. The ushers have a Bible that we'd like to give you, but we really want to just walk with you and celebrate this decision uh, with you. And keep your hands up until an usher sees you. If you um, have some questions about what it means to have a relationship with God. Um, I think I had a hand back here. Can we thank God for those? I can't always see everybody, but I think I had a few. If you're watching online, you can see, you can just text that word alive to that number, and it's a great way we can follow up with you. If you have any questions about what it means to have a relationship with God, or if you made that decision, I want to encourage you to stop by Connections after the service, uh, either one, either room on the right or left of the auditorium. And that's our way that we can walk with you. That, you know, when you make a decision to follow Jesus, we're not like, hey, good luck. Hope everything works out for you. We want to walk with you because this journey of faith is not meant to be walked alone. All right, can you all stand, please? Next week, we're starting a brand new series called Remembered. You know, in the Bible, the word remember, some form of it, is listed about 150 times. Kind of reminds me of a parent, you know, you keep telling your kid, Rem remember, don't forget. We're gonna look at five different significant situations Jesus had as he was heading to the cross. What happened then and what does it mean to us today? You're not gonna wanna miss this series. It'll actually take us the whole way to Easter Sunday, which is the first week of April. It's gonna be a great series. I hope you can stay connected through that. Um, it's gonna be great. And if you need prayer for any reason, we'll have a prayer team down front. Please feel free to come. Don't leave here without somebody praying with you if you really need that. We'd love to pray with you and uh, walk with you in that way. Hey, never forget, you, because of what Jesus has done, you have been made for this moment. Let that be a message that carries you through tomorrow and every day into the future. Have a great week. We love you. And uh, see you next weekend.